Multivariable Calculus Section 14.6, The Divergence Theorem. We invented it first. Nein, ich war mich. There's actually a debate as to who should really get credit for this theorem. There's a Russian mathematician and a German mathematician who both get credit. Let's review flux. We saw in an earlier lesson that we could take a surface integral that was the definition of flux, f dot n ds, and instead evaluate a double integral over the shadow of s on the xy plane using this integrand. So here's a picture of that. We have a curved surface in space, and instead of doing a surface integral, we can instead do a double integral over the flat region. And if that flat region is a rectangle, then we're really happy. Now, um, in two dimensions, flux is measured uh, through a closed curve, the same integrand except it's ds, the change along the uh, curve rather than the change along the surface. And that also could be um, evaluated as a double integral over the region that that closed curve uh, bounded using that integrand. And so there's a picture of a possible closed curve where the region would be easier to integrate over than the curve. So now, with the help of the divergence theorem, we're going to move to a closed surface and then um, have an integral to help us with the flux through that closed surface. Notice that um, the integrand in this double integral for flux is the divergence of f in two dimensions. So it kind of makes sense that when we move to three dimensions, we'll have a similar integral. The divergence theorem, aka the Gauss-Green theorem. Did you guess that the German dude was Gauss? aka Ostrogradsky's theorem, that's the Russian dude. Given a closed, smooth, or piecewise smooth surface, S, that bounds a space region, T, and in the outer unit vector for S and the vector field, F equal PQR, continuously differentiable over T, then the surface integral for flux equals this triple integral, the triple integral of the divergence of F, dV. Now let me point out that n has to be the outer unit vector for this to work. Uh, let me remind you of that. And also note that uh, we're going to use p, q, and r for f throughout. Now another way to write our flux integral is f dot ds, uh, similar to our line integral as being f dot dr, but we don't actually use that for computations. And then the um, triple integral over the volume is the divergence, which the definition of divergence was del dot f. And so del dot f, obviously, if f is pqr, gives you the triple integral that we will use to do our calculations. And all of these integrals compute the flux, the flux through the surface, the closed surface that bounds the space region t. Now, the intuitive reason why the divergence theorem works. Here we have the two integrals, surface integral and the triple integral over a volume. So here's our volume with the green surface. And this one measures the amount of flow through the surface of the space region because we're doing f dot n, and n is perpendicular to the surface. So we're going out through the surface. And this one measures how much the fluid is diverging from each of the points inside the solid, or how it's expanding away from the points. So if the, if the fluid is moving away from the points, then it makes sense that that would be the same as what you end up having going through the surface. Here's a pictorial intuitive reason. You've got all these little points inside, and the fluid is diverging from those points and then through the surface. So more about n dot ds, where s is the surface. Here we have a surface, and we have our two tangent vectors, which um, bound a parallelogram, which would be the change, which would approximate the change along the surface. And one of the vectors is uh, partial derivative of r with respect to u times the change in u, and the other one is the partial derivative of r 
with respect to V times a change in V, where we have a two-dimensional parametrization of the surface. Now, if we uh, have a normal vector there, then it's going to be the cross product of these two vectors. And that is going to have the same value in length as the area of the little par parallelogram. And so it's going to be the area of the parallelogram times the unit normal vector. So then we have our, if we change our um, vector valued function that's parameterizing the uh, surface to x and y for u and v, then we get our vector valued function as x comma y comma f of x comma y, where that's the z value on the surface, that f of x comma y. And so we can change the u's to x's, and so we get um, the derivative of r with respect to x in the first component is just 1. So that's going to be 1 times a change in x. And then the, the derivative with respect to x on that second component is 0, because there is no x value in that middle term. The middle term's y. So its derivative with respect to x is 0. And then the derivative with respect to x of f is just whatever it is, f sub x. And again, we're multiplying each of those components of the derivative uh, by delta x. Similarly, if we replace v with y, we get 0 for the derivative of x with respect to y. And then moving along to the middle component of r, y, its derivative with respect to y is 1. And again, it's times delta y. And then finally, the partial derivative of f with respect to y times delta y. So these are our two vectors. And if we cross them, we will get a normal vector to the surface which is um, the area of s, the change in s, times a unit vector. So to get the unit vector, we'll just divide by the area of s. So here's our cross product. And we put the vectors that uh, we have figured out on the first and second rows. We copy the first two columns. And most of the diagonals are 0. The only ones that are not 0 going down is that one and going up are these two. So we go ahead and add all that together and we get this vector and we can factor out the delta x delta y and so it's a nice review of why f dot nds is in fact equal to f dot this vector dx dy because we're letting the change in x and y go to instantaneous when we do the integral and when you cross PQR with that other vector there, then this is what you get. And this is the formula that we used to evaluate our surface integrals if, in fact, we could express z as a function of x and y. So this is the one we use the most. And then this is the one that we have in the divergence theorem that is equivalent to the surface integral. So which one of these two formulas do you want to use? Well, it all depends on how they shake out. So we have choices. And of course, in the textbook, they say use this one or use that one. But um, on quizzes and so on or out in the so-called real world, you might have to decide which integral is going to be uh, more efficient. So now we'll look at some of the uh, problems. Verify Ostrogradsky's divergence theorem by direct computation of the surface integral. And then by using the triple integral, where f is x, y, y, z, x, z, and s is the surface of a cube bounded by the coordinate planes and the planes x equal 2, y equal 2, and z equal 2. So here's our surface integral. And here's our cube. So I'm going to start with the top surface. You see, for the surface integral, you're going to have six different surfaces, which is a little bit annoying, but they're easy surfaces. They're all flat. So for the top surface, we have n equaling k. And so if we dot f with k, we only get that third component. And so um, on the surface, z is always 2. So x is the only thing that's varying. And so we have 2x. And the area is in the direction of x and y. And both x and y go from 0 to 2. So we integrate with respect to x and get x squared. From 0 to 2, we get 4. And then we integrate with respect to y, and we get 4y from 0 to 2, and we get 8. 
Now we're going to do the right side. And now what is little n? Well, it's only pointing in the y direction, so it's j. And therefore, we only get the middle component of f. And on the side, y is always 2. And x and z are going to go from 0 to 2. And I won't belabor that because it's the same as the previous integral. It's also going to come out to 8. Continuing the front side, now we have a vector. A little n is pointing in the x direction, so it's i. And so we only get the first component of f, x, y. And again, without showing that, that's also going to come out to 8. OK, that's 3 down and 3 to go. The bottom surface, its normal is going to be pointing down, so that's negative k. So we get negative xz. Now, notice that z is 0 at the bottom, so guess what? We get 0. And now the left side, its uh, normal vector point, its outward normal vector, unit normal vector, is pointing in the negative y direction, so we're crossing, uh, excuse me, we're dotting f with negative j, we get negative yz, but over there y is 0, so again we get 0. And finally the back side, um, our normal vector is pointing backwards, so negative i, and so we get negative the first component, and there x is always 0, so that's also going to come out to 0. So if we add up the 3 eighths from the previous slide and these three zeros, we get the total answer for the flux uh, through this cube's surface, 24. So now here we're going to go with the triple integral from the divergence theorem. And so there's our cube, and there's our vector field. And if we take a look at our partial derivative of p, which is x, y with respect to x, that's just y. And the second component, y, z, the partial derivative of that, that's q, with respect to y is z. And the third component, r, the derivative of x, z, with respect to z is just x. So there's our triple integral. So just arbitrarily, I'm going to arrange dv as dx, dy, dz. And each of the variables x, y, and z go from 0 to 2. So integrating with respect to x first, I get x, y plus x, z plus 1 half x squared evaluated from 0 to 2, which gives me 2y plus 2z plus 2. Now integrating with respect to y, I get y squared plus 2yz plus 2y evaluated again from 0 to 2. And that gives me 4 plus 4z plus 4. I combined, it, combined the two 4s for, to get 8. Antiderivative of 8 with respect to z is 8z, and the antiderivative of 4z with respect to z is 2z squared, again evaluated from 0 to 2. And I do indeed get the very same answer I got doing it separately with six surfaces, 24. Number six, use Ostrogradsky's theorem. I like to say Ostrogradsky. <laughs> you can say Green Gauss or Divergence theorem if you like, to evaluate the flux integral given this vector field. And S is still the same cube in the first octant bounded by the planes x equal to, y equal to, and z equal to. And here's our triple integral from Ostrogradsky's theorem. And so again, x, y, and z are going to go from 0 to 2. And this time, the partial derivative of p is with respect to x is 2x. The partial derivative of q with respect to y is 2y. And the partial derivative of r with respect to z is 2z. And again, it doesn't matter what order we integrate in, so arbitrarily I chose x. Integrate with respect to x, and we get this evaluated from 0 to 2, which yields this integrand. And then we integrate with respect to y, and we get that evaluated from 0 to 2. And then we, OK, so we put the 2 in, and we get uh, 8 plus 8 plus 8z, eight and I combine the 8s. Antiderivative with respect to z for 16 is 16z, and the antiderivative of 8z with respect to z is 4z squared. Again, evaluated from 0 to 2. And our final answer for this flux is 48. Number 10, 
use Ostrogradsky's theorem to evaluate the surface integral for flux given this vector field, U. And S is the surface of the region bounded by the paraboloid, z equals x squared plus y squared, and the plane, z equals 9. So here's my picture. We're cutting it off at 9 on the z-axis, so uh, that top surface would be 9 equals x squared plus y squared, so the radius is 3. And here's our triple integral from the divergence theorem, excuse me, Ostrogradsky's theorem. And so our partial derivatives are easy. Ah, I was a little worried, but see, in the first component, only the first term has an x in it. So the second term, e to the negative y sine z, goes to 0. And we just use the coefficient of x, y squared, which is y squared, the coefficient of x, that is. Then if we look at the middle term, same kind of thing happens, that e to the negative x cosine z has no y in it. So we just look at the x squared y, and the derivative with respect to y then is just x squared. And lo and behold, the last component doesn't have any z in it at all. So the partial derivative of r with respect to z is 0. Now I'm looking at this y squared plus x squared. Hmm, have I learned my lesson from previous times that that should be r squared? So let's take a look at how r is varying. It starts out at 0 and then goes out and hits the paraboloid. So if we look up at the equation of the paraboloid, it's equivalent to z equals r squared. So r squared goes from 0 to what? Well, it goes from 0 to the square root of z. And then um, we can let theta, of course, go all the way around from 0 to 2 pi, and we can let z go from the bottom up to the top 0 to 9. So we're going to start out with our integrand in terms of r. x squared plus y squared is r squared, and dv, don't forget that extra r in dv when we switch to uh, cylindrical coordinates, dv becomes r dr d theta dz. So we take the antiderivative with respect to r and we get 1 fourth r to the fourth evaluated from 0 to the square root of z and then we get we evaluate that we get 1 fourth z squared integrate with respect to theta and we get 1 fourth z squared theta evaluated from 0 to 2 pi and that gives us pi over 2z squared which integrates to pi over 6z cubed from 0 to 9 and we get an answer of 243 pi over 2. Okay, just to show you another option, we could have let z be the, the first variable that we integrated with respect to, and z goes from the bowl up to the bottom of the bowl up to 9, the paraboloid. So we could let z go from r squared up to 9, and then we have to integrate with respect to z first. But notice that regardless of how you choose, what to integrate with respect to first. Your first, your, your inner integral has to have the variables on the limits, okay? So we integrate with respect to z and we get r cubed z evaluated from r squared to 9 and that comes out to 9 r cubed minus r to the fifth. Now integrating with respect to r, we get 9 fourths r to the fourth minus 1 6 r to the sixth evaluated from 0 to 3 because see now you can let r just go from the center out to the edge of the paraboloid. Okay, so then we integrate, we evaluate that and integrate with respect to theta, and we get the same final answer as before. So now if you think your calculus book is heavy and big, look at this poor child, and enjoy your problems using the divergence theorem in 14.6.